question that is really left. Sure. Come on. Come on. I appreciate your patience and sticking out to the very end. Almost, it's not over. Questions, comments, please. Yes, sir. In other times, in other parts of the world, what happens when countries are taken over by other countries and borders change in terms of property rights? Well, the laws of war are uh, quite clear, but the implementation of them is very muddy. And uh, there is one basic uh, reality that we are facing, we're facing now in the West Bank, that often countries are facing, is when you conquer the land, if it's vacant from population, that's simple. If the land is heavily populated, you have to deal with the local population. Now, the West Bank is presently occupied, occupied populated by 2.7 million Palestinians. And it's a very small piece of land. It's, it, uh, those of you who visited the Israel region, you can get a sense of how dense it is. Now, to penetrate into this piece of land so heavily populated and establish a new community, well, while at the same time creating a very harsh separation between the local population and the new community, has consequences that we cannot ignore. And they are irreconcilable. So the reality, sooner or later, is going to blow up in our face. We can call it apartheid, we can call it any way we want, or we can just not call it anything. But it's evident that the historic evolution of a situation of this nature is unavoidable. And in my view, it's our responsibility as Israelis, or those who have uh, emotional or intellectual uh, interest in the region or in Israel, that we cannot just sit and wait. It eventually will blow up in our face. Yes. Yes, please. Uh, uh, the question was, what is the opinion of the Israelis on the, the other side of the green light toward the settlers? Uh, I would like to believe that many feel the way I do. Uh, however, uh, not often their voices are being expressed. At present time, uh, we are facing a reality which evolved in the last it's a decade, but most strongly in the last years, uh, where there is a very strong pressure from a growing and aggressive right in Israel that opposes any genuine discussion about that reality. And so much so that the, the Labour Party, or whatever is left of the Labour Party, that was and is a descendant of the party that it's Hakrabin was its prime minister, and Tzhak Rabin methodically, from the very beginning, was very clear about the status of the settlement, and you can see it in the film, and you can hear a brief of he, a comment that he made in 1974, what he called Gush and the beginning of the settlement enterprise, as a cancer to the democratic fabric of the state of Israel. 20 years later, he was assassinated because he started a peace process that threatened the existence of the settlement in the West Bank. Now, much more the threat that Israel is facing is by far bigger from within rather than from any outside potential enemy. And I really believe that there is an existential threat that Israel is facing uh, because of this disintegration from within. And in a way, I would say that the settlements, either they are the manifestation of this threat or they are the cause of this threat. But either way, I'm afraid that the result, if we are not going to act against it, is inevitable. Yes, please, ma'am. Uh, the 
question was, what are the chances to release the film in Israel? And if I personally think that I, that I, I may become a target to those who uh, are thinking different than I do. Uh, the film uh, has been already uh, purchased or was co-sponsored in the making by uh, quite an active uh, cable TV in Israel called Yes Doku, many of you may know the channel. Uh, and uh, they are very proud of the film and they are going to promote it heavily and, and to release it. Uh, in parallel, we have interest from some theatrical uh, distributors that are interested in releasing it. And that's come, of course, from the land of Tel Aviv. Um, about, right? I don't know, I, I served for a good number of years, more than many others, uh, on the other side, I'd say, the Israeli military. And, uh, you know, I faced uh, threats and I faced uh, potential harm. And I'm not embracing it, I'm not asking for it, but that's the way that we live our lives. And I believe that we have to voice our opinion. And in my view, that fight that we're facing now is probably more meaningful, more important than the fights that we had in 67, 73. Probably the big shift was in 82 when Israel started a war that it called the war of choice, the Lebanon invasion. If you remember, it was a... Sharon was the Minister of Defense and they started the 48 hours operation into southern Lebanon that uh, ended, if you end up now, how long it took? The 48 hours operation ended 18 years later, <laughs> when Barack was elected Prime Minister. Yes, about the character of the film, the filmmaking, uh, questions? Yes, please. Before the film started, I um, tried to present the three levels or wings that are creating the film. One of them was the ideological, uh, ideological and religious uh, background or drives that, that made this movement possible. Uh, one of them is the belief in the Messiah. Now, I'm not a religious person. I do respect religious individuals as long as religion is between an individual and his God. I do not accept uh, if that imposes on me or on my fellow secular others uh, to follow whatever he believes that is between him and his God. Messiah, in my view, it's a wonderful concept, but the essence of this concept is a future time. And it will always be a future time. The moment that you concretize it, the moment you make it in something tangible, something physical, in my view, it loses. It, you know, it's a dream. You cannot materialize it. And we have a beautiful uh, commentary on that from Moshe Halbertal, a brilliant professor from the Hebrew University, that talks about sanctity. For if it's sacred to me, it's mine. Because it's contradictory to the essence of something that is sacred. And we're so, so clear and eloquent about it. And I really could identify with that perception. So, yes, please. The woman that you interviewed who lived in the yurt, uh, yes. I'm curious how prevalent the concept is. She admitted that she was illegal. Do you sense that that's a very uh, rare belief, or is it fairly common? Well, uh, I hope that the film uh, made it clear that the fabric of the settlers is very, it's extremely uh, versatile. You have religious, you have uh, 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 newcomers from Russia or from other uh, territories, and you have those who just came because it's cheaper to live in the West Bank than in Petah Tikva, than in Tel Aviv. And it's much cheaper. And often it's much nicer. It's beautiful views, and you could see, and you know, the land is really beautiful. It's, it's, you want to embrace it. It feels like it embraces you. 
But it does not mean that you have to possess it. You can enjoy it without possession. I like the Alps very much. Hmm. <laughs> right. uh, so it's really uh, what she expresses is is genuine. She's a very genuine individual. She's a second generation settler. She was born in Tkoa. And uh, after the Oslo Accord, it was made clear that there was a freeze of building new settlements. So instead of building new settlements, so to speak, new settlements, we have to take Tkoa B, Tkoa C, Tkoa D, and Tkoa H. Five Tkoas, but it's still called Tkoa. And it's spread over a long piece of territory. So she lives in Tkoa D, which is also considered the hippies. <laughs> and there are wonderful people, and it's really, it's heartbreaking. What do you do when good people do bad things? What do you do? You have to face some, oh, to face, yes. So uh, a big part of the incentive and resolution of the settlement to be to see the key, the, some solution to the Palestinians. Most of my Israeli friends who generally are on the left become so discouraged I'm not a politician. I, I do not uh, propose solutions. I'm trying to observe the reality and raise questions. Now, in my view, the threat that Israel faces, and I said it earlier, is from within. Israel is it's one of the strongest military in the world. It's capable to handle any security situation that will fall into its hands. It cannot handle a disintegration from within. And this is an absolute. And that's what we're facing. Daesh, ISIS, whoever, yes, it's, it's terrible. And it's very possible that they will become a part of the reality in the West Bank. But in my view, the reality that will happen is much bigger if we will ignore the, the rights of Palestinians to self-determination. We cannot sustain an apartheid, apartheid de facto, which is the reality in the West Bank forever. It will not last. Now, we can ignore it, we can turn away, but it will chase us and it will blow in our face. That's, that's the way I see it. Yes, please. Yes. You've got people from both sides speaking to Israeli candidates. I'm thinking specifically of the person uh, about 15 years. Yeah. What, what did you present was your piece of work? Who specifically are you asking? The three? The three mirrors, the story about the three mirrors. Yes, oh, yes, yes. That's where uh, the assassinate is coming from. Right, the guy who was actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he served his time. Okay. What I've learned through my work in, I, I normally do fiction, narrative films. That's the second documentary that I've made. I did a few years ago a documentary called Hot House that was also presented here at Sundance uh, about Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jail. What I learned there, and even more so now, is that when you ask somebody a question, they tend to respond. People tend to answer to questions. Even more, they tend to answer even if you do not ask them questions. <laughs> so, um, especially when you have a camera. But I must say that every interview that I've conducted, I made it clear to my interviewee from the very beginning, uh, I expressed my political belief. And I did not want to include in the film any testimony or any statement that I would steal from them. Uh, I didn't find it valuable for the film, and I, I personally, I, I, I have no interest in that. But at the same time, it created, I think, for a more thorough discussion. There was a harder attempt from the other side to prove me wrong or to express their views. Now, they see things the way they see. When Pinchasi Baron, the, the young, handsome, charming almost guy that declares that he is a racist, mm -hmm. right. tells in front of the camera how he and his son, when he grew up, are going to beat the Arabs. I was filming, I think, don't say it, it doesn't sound good, don't say it. <laughs> and he was so proud to say it. So, what do you do with it? I was thinking, should I include it in the film? Should I not? But he, repeated itself several times and it was clear to me that he does not see the way I see it. And I think that it's a, it's a valuable testimony 
So I'm not trying to show to shed that light on him. That's what he believes, and that's what I brought to you. So, yes. What, what do you make of the ideological argument that this some sort of uh, conversation is necessary? And this is uh, a very similar story to what happened in America, but even that last, but especially you see the same sort of religious sentiment of manifest destiny. I do not recall that America had this religious uh, uh, destiny to conquer this land. It's my ignorance, but I don't think so. But the way that America resolved the situation with the Indians in this continent is not very much applicable in the West Bank. We cannot kill or exterminate 2.7 million Palestinians, not even one. But this reality is not possible. We cannot expel them, and there are quite a few on the right of Israel that believe that that's the way we should do it. And you know, we have to face the reality the way it presents itself. And the gentleman here asked at the beginning of our conversation, that's what happens in wars. I do not know this world. So when Gingis Khan would conquer half of Europe, just like that, running over the frozen rivers, of, of the Danube running into Austria, Hungary, he was very wise. He just made the population a part of his, of his uh, uh, kingdom. He included them rather than uh, creating separation. So I do not know. I'm not going to uh, promote Jesus Khan here. But uh, <laughs> the idea is that we really have to deal with the facts. And there is a, 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 quite a typical tendency on the right, on the extreme right, but even in the center right, to treat facts as something that is a nuisance. And what can I tell you? Counterfactual will not take us too far. Too far. It's, it's, it's not going to work. Yes, one. Well, yes, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, Israel society, I think, is very open. I mean, they, they talk about the movie, they talk about the table channel. Israelis deal with this issue all the time. The settlers are a minority. There's 400,000, they're a minority of 7 million people living in modern cities as well. What is stopping, somebody mentioned here, the issue of security. Prime Ministers have taken down settlements to the right, and uh, Benny Gibbs and Shaol uh, have been put down settlements not to the right. What is stopping that happening now? How do Israelis feel when they see this? The reality in Israel is quite uh, complicated in the sense that there is a fatigue that somehow like a, a, a layer of fog that covers the population. The cycles of war, of terror, are repeating themselves almost without interruption through this modern history. And you, you follow the news, you see that every day there is a stabbing in, in Jerusalem, in, in Hebron, and actually in Hebron there is a lot of stabbing. But you could see the reality in Hebron. You cannot say it's unmitigated. You cannot say it happens in void. And often the politicians of Israel are using it to inflame uh, the situation even further. A, when there is a terror attack in Israel, the Prime Minister, that they now recently, a, just with a brush of stroke, put the entire Arab Israeli population as hostile to the state of Israel. He says, we cannot have two states here, so to speak. And this is wrong. So, I think that the voices on the left, just to make it simple, are there. But they are not strong enough. The population at large is dealing with the immediate economical conditions, etc. There is a fatigue. And I'm afraid that before it will become any better, it will have to become somewhat worse. Um, I thank you all very much.